Luke 24, verses 1 to 12. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the grave, carrying the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance to the grave, so they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there puzzled about this, when suddenly two men in bright shining clothes stood by them. Full of fear, the women bowed down to the ground as the men said to them, Why are you looking among the dead for one who is alive? He is not here. He has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee? The Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men, be nailed to the cross, and rise to life on the third day. Then the women remembered his words, returned from the grave, and told all these things to the eleven disciples and all the rest. The women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. They and the other women with them told these things to the apostles. But the apostles thought that what the women said was nonsense and did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the grave he bent down and saw the grave cloths and nothing else. Then he went back home, wondering at what had happened. I have told you about two Oxford men, Lord Littleton and Gilbert West, who in the 1920s decided to spend an entire summer vacation studying the records of the resurrection with a view to proving that Jesus never rose from the dead. They spent those two months separately going into the matter at depth and when they met they embarrassed each other by having to admit that the evidence had convinced them that Jesus rose from the dead. And they published a book in the 1920s, a typical long-winded title of that period. It's called Observations on the History and Evidences of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. About ten years later, a young man called Frank Morrison, studying law, decided to do exactly the same, realizing that if you could once prove that Jesus was still like John Brown a moldering in his grave, somewhere in Palestine, that Christianity as a religion would collapse. And so he examined the evidence, started writing his book to prove that Jesus was dead, and finished up by having to write a totally different book, which you can buy on the bookstore called Who Moved the Stone? And Frank Morrison, too, was convinced that Jesus is alive. Professor Herbert Butterfield, professor of modern history in Cambridge, I have heard him say that the resurrection narratives convince him also of the historical accuracy of those who've given us the story of the resurrection. Dr. Arnold of Rugby, who started his first school with the prefect system, which later became famous in the public school, who started his first school just a few miles away from here on the banks of the Thames at Laleham. He was also convinced by a study of the stories of the resurrection that Jesus Christ was alive. If a person does not believe that Jesus is alive, there is only one reason for that. It is that they want to believe that he's dead. They cannot have studied the evidence. They cannot have studied the narratives of those who were there at the time. One of the most striking features of the stories of the resurrection in our Bible is that there are discrepancies between the stories told by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it is those very discrepancies which convince us of the truth. If men are making up a story, if they are concocting an alibi, one thing marks out such a concoction, such an invention, it is this, that the stories agree in every detail. And any detective, any magistrate, any judge, any jury will tell you this, that if a number of different people tell exactly the same story with exactly the identical detail, they have made that story up. But when you study the four Gospels, 
the very kind of discrepancy that occurs when you have different people witnessing the same sequence of events, that very kind of discrepancy occurs here. J.B. Phillips, who translated the New Testament into English, produced a book a year or two ago called Ring of Truth. And in that book he says that as he translated these stories, every one of them had the ring of truth in them. Real people, real reactions, real events. And he too was convinced. These discrepancies are not contradictions. They are discrepancies which when looked at closely fit together into a sequence of events which you can reconstruct. They have the ring of truth. The kind of discrepancy is this. Luke says that Peter ran to the tomb. The Gospel of John says that Peter and John ran to the tomb. There is a discrepancy there, not a contradiction. It's clear that both are true, but the ring of truth comes that one person noticed Peter and someone else knew that there were two. That's the kind of discrepancy that if this story had been invented would not have occurred. Not a contradiction, but a discrepancy. Another one is that Mark says that when the women came to the tomb, a shining angel spoke to the women. But when Luke recorded these events, he says two shining angels came. Discrepancy, yes, but naturally one of those two would be the spokesman and Luke mentions both and Mark mentions the one who spoke. There is not a contradiction there, but there is the kind of discrepancy that true witnesses would record. And so as we read these stories, the thing that hits us again and again is this is straight history. These things actually happened. And the way the people behaved is the way we would have behaved in the circumstances. Have you ever seen a ghost? Have you ever s confronted a visitor from the supernatural world? If you did, I'll bet you were afraid, <laughs> as these were. And if you did now, you would be afraid. Your heart would miss a beat. Some of you would crouch down. Some of you would shrink some of you would measure your distance to the door and want to get out of the place. You would behave just like these women. And if some women came to you in an excited condition outside this building and said they'd just been to the cemetery up the mount here and they'd seen a grave open and they'd seen somebody walk out of the grave, would you say, I believe you? <laughs> Thanks for telling me. No. Say, what have you been drinking? You're excited, you're overwrought. That's how the men behaved here. We're reading natural events, we're reading about real facts, and our faith is squarely based on history. I'm so glad that it is, because unlike every other sacred book in the world, the Bible is simply a string of historical facts, things that actually happened. We don't follow flights of philosophy, we don't let our fancy take us into the clouds of mysticism, we base our faith on what has happened in this world of ours. Things that once done can never be undone. They may put Jesus in the tomb and put a stone over it and seal the stone and guard the seal, but once Jesus is out of that tomb, they can never put him back into it. History cannot be unwritten. And so we're going to look at the first 12 verses of Luke's Gospel this morning and look at two groups of people First, we're going to look at the women and how they reacted. Then we're going to look at the men and how they reacted on this first Easter Sunday. You ladies, you have the honor of your sex in being the first to know that Jesus had risen. And in a sense, that offsets and balances two other firsts for you women First, it was through a woman that sin entered the human race. It was through Eve, a woman, that the darkness of Satan first entered into human thinking and relationships. And as if God wanted to do something so appropriate to respond to that, it was through a woman 
that salvation first entered the human race. And it was two women who first knew that the Son of God was coming to earth and had come, Mary and Elizabeth. And so you women have this honor. You have the embarrassment that a woman brought sin into the human race, but you have the honor that a woman brought salvation into the human race in the person of the Son of God. And it was to women first that the news of today was given. To the women who were there because they had plucked up enough courage to come and do something that needed to be done, but which was distasteful and unpleasant to do. I must speak for a moment about the funeral customs in those days. If I must be realistic, then forgive me, but I want you to understand how these women felt. When a person died in those days, if he was to be given a funeral of honor, his body would be semi-embalmed and special spices with aromatic and antiseptic qualities would be strapped to the body to counteract the natural process of decay and corruption that sets in so quickly, particularly in that climate. That process of decay really set in in a cool tomb in that climate on the fourth day. And therefore there was a limited time in which you could counteract that process and try and stop it or try and delay it or try and fill the grave with a sweet smell. And so as soon as a person was dead, they would take 40 yards of long linen bandage and anything up to a hundredweight of these sweet spices and they would wrap the body round and round, tipping in the spices as they went, until strapped to the whole body, these spices were there to give that sweet smell and to stop the decay just a little. It was a loving act, the final thing that you could do for someone. It had been done when Jesus died, but it had been done in a hurry. And when Jesus died, we are told they did wrap his body. And we are told that the rich man who gave his own grave had given also some spices, which no doubt he'd got in a cupboard for his own corpse. And they had hastily wrapped the body. But they only had three hours between Jesus' death and the beginning of the Passover. Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon. The Passover began at six at sunset. And in that time, they had to go to Pilate persuade Pilate that Jesus was dead, persuade Pilate to release the body, take the body from the cross, carry it to the garden, wrap it up in spices, put it in the tomb, put the stone there, seal it, and do everything before six o'clock that night. They had three hours in which to arrange the entire funeral, and the job was not properly done. I told you earlier this morning that I believe Jesus died on Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock. That's the only time that really fits everything said in the Bible. But I wouldn't be too dogmat dogmatic. It might have been Thursday. I'm almost sure it wasn't Friday. But he was three days and three nights by the Jewish calendar in the tomb. And yet by the Roman calendar, he rose on the third day, which means that he rose sometime between 6 p.m. on the Saturday and midnight. Difficult for us to get into the thinking of Jews, whereby the day begins at six o'clock in the evening. And so any time after six o'clock on Saturday evening, Jesus could have risen. We know he'd risen long before dawn on Sunday. The grave had been empty long before the women got there, and they got there before the sun was up, just at the first light of day. So that sometime between 6 p.m. and midnight... Now the Sabbath that followed Jesus' death was a high Sabbath, a special bank holiday for Passover, and that would be immediately followed by the weekly Sabbath, the Saturday, and so the women were kept from doing the job properly until first light on Sunday morning. It was the very earliest opportunity they could do this. During the Passover, you couldn't touch a dead body or you'd be defiled. During the Sabbath, you must do no work. And so as soon as they could, they got out of bed early that morning and went to complete the embalming. They would only just be in time. Do you realize that by this time, first rigor mortis would have set in and the task of wrapping those bandages round a stiff would have been very difficult. And do you realize that having had to wait that long, the process of decay would have begun. 
And those dear women loved the Lord so much that they were prepared to come even while it was just, just the beginning of the day and still dark and to come to an eerie place, to come alone without men and to come with spices and to be prepared to tackle that job. What courage and what love. That's what they did. And because of that, they were the first to know that Jesus was not there. I'm telling you this because you can realize their nerves would be in a state of tension already. They would already be pulling themselves together to do the job. They would be wondering what they would find in there. And so they were already in a state of some tension. No wonder then that they were totally perplexed and puzzled to find things totally different. To find the soldiers gone, to find the stone which must have weighed many hundred weights pushed aside, probably weighed a ton and a quarter, that's the average weight of these rolling stones that you can still find in the Middle East, to find that rolled away and to go in and find the body gone on top of the tension that they'd been building up to do this thing. To find all that, they were now totally thrown off balance. They were bewildered. Their minds had come to a full stop. They didn't know where to go next. Do you know that's usually what God does? Just before he's going to show you something wonderful. He brings your plans to a full stop. He throws you into a turmoil. He brings you to a place where you don't know where to go next. And that's a lovely place to be. It's a place where God is going to step in and say something new. In a lesser degree, we've all had experiences like this with the Lord. We've made plans to do something, we've thought we were doing it for him, and we thought it was right to do, and we went ahead, and, and somehow it all fizzled out, it all came to nothing. And it seemed as if we'd come to a dead end, and, and we, we didn't know where to go next. And, and it's then that God says something totally different, totally new. So they were in tension, they were bewildered, they were thrown off guard, their minds were in a bit of a turmoil, and at that point, two angels stepped into the picture. That was... The last straw. It really was. They were terrified. That's the word. It's the strongest word for fear in the Greek language. They were terrified. And they, it says here, they bowed down to the ground. That's putting it mildly. Their knees turned to water and they collapsed. They were so terrified they just sank down. Some of you ladies will understand exactly that. It was the way that nature in their bodies relieved the tension. They just collapsed. And there they crouched on the ground with wide staring eyes, open mouths, and panting breath and beating hearts, wondering what on earth was going to happen. Do you know there are people who don't even believe that angels exist? There are people who don't realize that we are surrounded by myriads upon myriads of intelligent beings other than human beings. And that they know what goes on on earth, that they are watching. It's not just childish to think about the angels guarding you while you sleep. The hosts of the Lord encamp around those who fear him. The angels are there. We don't need to think of this universe as an empty place, that away from earth there's no life. There's life right through the universe. The skies are full. And with angels and archangels, we praise God today. And at point after point in crisis in Jesus' life, the angels are there helping, speaking for God, ministering in some way, doing something positive. They were there at his birth, putting it right with Joseph, explaining what was happening to him, preparing Mary for this incredible event, warning Joseph and Mary to take the little child down to Egypt. They are there with our Lord in the wilderness when he's tempted by Satan and desperately needs succor. And the wild beasts were around him and the devil was tempting him, but the angels came and ministered to him. They were there when Jesus desperately needed company in Gethsemane. And, and Jesus said to his disciples, will you stay here and watch and pray? When he came back, they were all asleep. And it says this, the angels came and ministered. And when there's no one else to help you, remember the angels. And here at this point, the angels came. They were just tidying up the grave. That's all. It was an angel who came and rolled that stone away. 
The angels were God's messengers releasing that tomb. And the stone was rolled away, I believe, not to let Jesus out, for in his resurrection body he could pass through closed doors and through the very grave clothes. It was to let the world in. So the angel rolled the stone away and sat on it. What a lovely picture of strength. Jesus had 10,000 angels as his personal bodyguard. It only took one of them to roll that stone away, and a couple of them came to meet the women. It was a frightening experience, but now I want you to notice what the angel said to the women. Why are you here? If I can paraphrase it, the angel said, What on earth are you doing? What on earth are you doing? Why did they say that? If the women were surprised to meet the angels there, it is also true that the angels were surprised to meet the women there. And said, why? Why? And if you want a theme for this morning's Bible study, I want you to get it from this word, why. Why are you behaving as you are, say the angels to the women? And that's a question I want to try and answer. Why were they seeking the living among the dead? Do you realize that half the human race is dead and half is alive on this Easter Sunday, 1974? That the population growth is so rapidly accelerating, the graph going up so steeply, that in fact, half the human race is alive today. There are as many people alive on earth now as there are lying in their graves. It's a sobering thought. But in which half do you look for Jesus? The answer is you'll find him among the living. If you want to find the Lord Jesus, the last place to go is a cemetery. Go where there are living people because he's not among the dead. He's not to be found in a crematorium or a graveyard. He's to be found here where there are living people. Why look for the living among the dead? It's crazy to think of Jesus as dead and gone. To class him with all those great people whose bones lie in our earth. It's crazy to think like that. It's just silly. Why seek you the living among the dead? What on earth were they doing there? Wasting their time, wasting their money, wasting everything else. Why had they come? And I want to give you two reasons why the church, why the women were there that day and show you that the church today is guilty of the same two faults. Number one, those women were there at the grave because they were letting common sense dictate their action. They were letting common sense dictate their action. And common sense says when a person's dead, they're dead. And common sense says when a person's buried, they're buried. And common sense says dead people don't move. And therefore, if you want to find them, they're in the same place you put them. And common sense says that's the place to go. And common sense directed these women. Common sense said we must go at this time to this place and do this job. And common sense was wrong. They had started from natural reason, which assumes that what happens naturally is normal. Now, I want you to understand what I mean by this. Because we say things are natural, we think we are saying things are normal, but this doesn't follow. It is natural for people to die, but it is not normal for people to die. It is natural for people to have faults. It is not normal for people to have faults. It is natural for people to get sick. It is not normal to be sick. It is natural for people to decay, but it is not normal. And common sense can't follow my argument. You look around and you say, well, look, change and decay in all around I see. That's natural. And therefore it's normal. And therefore the normal thing to do is to go to a cemetery if you want to find Jesus. But can you see that what is natural is not normal? Death is not the normal end. Decay is not normal. Sickness is not normal. These things are invaders, intruders. They're abnormalities in God's world. God never intended people to be sick. God never intended people to die. God never intended people to decay in the grave. These were not normal things. 
They are unnatural, they are abnormal, they've come in with sin and they've spoiled our world and it's a tragedy that we now live in an abnormal world. But because we live in an abnormal world, common sense can be mistaken. Common sense can't believe the resurrection because common sense says it's not natural for dead people to rise, but I tell you it's normal. And there was one person who came to our world who lived a normal life. There's only been one normal person in the whole world. We're all abnormal. All the world's queer but me and thee, and I'm a bit worried about thee, as they used to say. <laughs> We're all queer, except one person was normal, and that person was Jesus. And he lived a normal life because he lived a good life, a pure life. He was God's holy one. That's normal. That's the life you were meant to live. And when you're living a holy life, you're living normally. You're living properly. You're living as God intended you to live. And God had said in his word that a person who lived a normal life would not see corruption. There it is in Psalm 16. And it's their common sense that got in the way. Their common sense said what is natural must be normal. Let's never accept the state of the world as it is. Let's never accept sickness and death as inevitable natural events. Even the scientist has no biological explanation for death. He cannot tell us why the body grows old and runs down and dies. He cannot tell us. A doctor can tell you the immediate cause of death, but this body is a very efficient machine. If I put enough food and air and exercise into it, this body can renew itself and rebuild new cells. It has that capacity. Why does it not go on doing that? Why can I no, not go on living and exercising and breathing fresh air forever? Why does the machine begin to run down? Why is there a clock inside my body which says something? So that while the scientist can point to the immediate cause of death, he can't point to the ultimate cause. The answer is it's not normal. It's not normal. You weren't made to die. You were made to live. You weren't made for sin. You were made for goodness. That's normal. And so they had used their common sense to deny normality and they had just not been able to think the thing through. The other reason why they came to the graveyard that morning was this. First, they had let common sense dictate their action and second, they had forgotten the word of the Lord. Now you put those two things together and that's why they wasted time and money and went to the wrong place and did the wrong thing. And that's why we do the wrong thing. We let our own common sense tell us what to do instead of remembering the word of the Lord. And no wonder we get into trouble. And so the angel said, why are you doing this? It's so silly to come and try and anoint a body that isn't there. Why did you come? Did you not remember what he said? Not just yesterday or last week, but months ago in Galilee. He's been warning you for months. He told you three things. He'd be handed over to wicked men. That happened, didn't it? Of course it did. He told you he'd been nailed to a cross. That happened, didn't it? Of course it did. And he told you he'd rise the third day. When two out of three things that he tells you actually happen, why can't you believe the third? Now can you see what the angels were saying? This Bible of ours over a quarter of its verses contain a prediction about the future. Something like 26% of the verses of the Bible contain a prediction about the future. And of those predictions, over 75%, over three quarters, something like 81% have actually literally come true. Common sense may deny the rest, but I tell you, if you remember the words of the Lord, you can be as sure that the other quarter will come true as that the three quarters have come true. Do you see what happens when we let common sense take over? This world looks as if it'll go on forever, doesn't it? I mean, it looks pretty solid. It's whirling through space, and those stars look as if they'll go on forever, and the sun looks as if it'll rise every morning forever. It looks that way, and common sense says there'll be a tomorrow and a tomorrow and a tomorrow. The Bible says there won't be. The Bible says it's going to come to an end and the heaven and earth that we know will pass away. Who are you going to believe, common sense or the word of the Lord? Common sense says human nature will always be sinful, will always be imperfect, no one's perfect and you can't make bad people good. Common sense says that, but the word of the Lord says that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. 
and that he is able to present us faultless before his throne of grace. Who are you going to believe, common sense or the word of the Lord? Now do you see that these women were just doing what we've done so often? Common sense says what is natural is normal. The word of the Lord says no, the normal way is God's way. That's totally different. It's the way of life and peace. Everlasting life, everlasting peace and righteousness and joy. Who are you going to believe? So these dear women were rebuked by the angels from heaven and the angels said, you know, we get so perplexed by you human beings. You do such silly things, you forget the words of the Lord and then you go around doing these things. Do you get the message? I wonder if the angels look down at us here in Millmead and say, you know, I just can't understand them. Why do they behave like that? Don't they remember what the Lord says? Don't they try and memorize what they've heard in sermons? Don't they try and recall that and let that decide? Or is it common sense? And so the angels who know much better, who see the will of God done and who do it, the angels in heaven do the will of God. And we've prayed already in this service, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're saying, oh, may we human beings be as sensible as the angels and get on with it and do what God says instead of trying to live by our own common sense. Well, we'll leave the women now in case you think I'm getting at them too much. Let's get on to the men. Let's see what the men did. Those women took the rebuke and they went back to the men and they presented those men first with the evidence and second with their own testimony of supernatural experience. And the men wouldn't believe. Now I'm going to say something to you men. Ladies needn't listen for a moment, but... Aren't we men only too ready to listen to a woman's voice if she's leading us into sin? And aren't we just so slow to listen to a woman's voice when she's trying to lead us into salvation? For while it was Eve who first sinned and who introduced sin to the human race, that's no credit to Adam. For Adam didn't even put up a fight, he didn't argue, he didn't claim his headship of the marriage as he should have done in the Lord. As Eve had failed to acknowledge that headship, Adam, Adam didn't claim it. He listened readily enough when Eve told him that the tree of the fruit, the fruit of the tree of knowledge was good and to be desired. He didn't argue, he believed it. And all through history men have believed women when the women were wanting to lead them to do something wrong. But we men are very reluctant to listen to our wives and our women when they want to lead us to the truth. This world is full of Christian wives who long to lead their husbands to the Lord and just long to bring them to the truth of the risen Christ. But their men folk don't listen. We'll listen when it's bad, but we don't believe when it's good. And these women came and they said, we've seen the empty tomb, we've seen the grave closed, the stone's gone, we've seen angels, and we've been reminded of the words of the Lord. Don't you remember how he said this would happen, and the two things have happened, and this is the third? It was a totally convincing case they put, and the men said, delirium. The literal word they use, translated here nonsense, means the delirious babblings of a fevered person. Somebody who's sick and these men said, you're sick, you're overwrought, these last few days have turned your mind, you're overexcited, we can see that. Well, of course they were, so would you have been if you'd just been chatting to angels. <laughs> but, but the men would not believe. I find this both comforting and challenging. It's comforting for this reason that the resurrection was not put out as a story by a group of men who wanted to believe it, by a group of men who were credulous fools who'd believe anything they heard about. These were a group of tough, down-to-earth, realistic men, tax collectors, fishermen, and they would not believe. And of course, therefore, do you realize that there would have been no preaching of the resurrection unless it had been true, because only the truth would have convinced these men. And so these men wouldn't believe, and that's comforting. The resurrection must have happened to convince these men. Nobody else could have convinced them. Jesus must be alive, or these men would not have gone out as flaming apostles to spread the news over the whole world. But I find it challenging for this reason. 
after three years with Jesus, they still didn't believe his words. That's sad. They were letting common sense dictate instead of the word of the Lord. And so they made the same mistake as the women folk. No wonder Jesus later on that day called two of them fools. You fools. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. You've got it in writing. You've had it from my lips. You've heard the testimony of the women. How much more do I have to give you? You fools. You're so slow to believe. Do you know that it is literally true that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is far stronger than the evidence for the existence of Julius Caesar. There are many, many more documents and far earlier documents about the resurrection than about the existence of Julius Caesar, yet I've never met anybody who didn't believe that there was a man called Julius Caesar who once invaded this country. Why? Oh, fools. What more evidence could we ask for? Promises centuries before it happened, records as soon as it happened, a testimony for 2,000 years. What more do people want? And the men didn't believe. But there was one man among them whose heart and mind were in a real turmoil. I want to try and get inside Simon Peter's mind. As Peter listened to these women he thought were hysterical, his mind was saying, supposing it's true. And I denied him. Supposing he's alive. Oh, I've got to get to him. I must meet him before he tells the other apostles about me. I must get right with him. I must meet him first. I must get on with it. I'm, I must find out. And Peter decided to find out straight away if it was true. And he set off for that grave as fast as he could go. At least he could check up the evidence. And he went to the tomb, and he found the wrapped up grave clothes collapsed, laid as they were, with the head turban up here. And he found nothing else. No angels. Nothing else. So he went off home by himself. And what someone has called the greatest untold story in the Bible occurred. Sometime that morning, Peter was alone. And suddenly a voice said, Hello, Peter. We don't know what transpired in that conversation. It's too sacred to repeat, so the Lord has not told us. I guess that Peter poured out his soul. He said, Lord, I denied you, I denied you. And between those two was forged a, a bond so deep that Jesus chose Peter to be the first pastor and look after the first church to feed his lambs. Peter and Jesus met that morning because this man said, I'm going to follow this through. I'm going to look at the evidence. I'm going to think it over. I'm going to find out. And so Peter went off alone. And all that morning, Jesus only appeared to two people, a woman called Mary and a man called Simon Peter. The meeting with Peter is mentioned later in this very chapter. It's mentioned in verse 34, because that evening when the two from Emmaus got back and said to the disciples, the Lord is risen, they said he's risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. And that's how we know it happened. And I want to tell you this, every one of you this morning, I know that most of you know that Jesus is alive. But I want to plead with anyone who does not know, the evidence is there. Study the evidence. Read the record. Listen to the testimony of those who've had supernatural experience of the Lord. But then you get away by yourself. And you think it through. And you let Jesus come into your life. I know it sounds crazy, 
that a man who died 2,000 years ago you can meet today. I know that common sense is all against it, but I want you to believe the word of the Lord because that's how people meet Jesus, when they leave common sense behind and say, if God says it, it's true. And if Jesus is willing to come into my life, then I'm going to ask him. And when I ask him, I'll thank him for coming because he keeps his word. And I'm going to believe in his word. And when you believe in his word, you find that he's real. And you can say, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Because you'll be able to say, he walks with me and talks with me. Yes, he's risen. He's appeared to Peter. He's spoken to you. You've met him. And though you haven't seen him with these eyes, you one day will, but you've met him. You've got a real relationship with him. And isn't it lovely how gently God introduced these people to the risen Jesus? I suppose that Jesus could have stood outside that tomb and waited for them to come. I suppose that Jesus could have come to them first thing in that morning, but to most of them he didn't come till the evening. Do you see that God gently leads people? He showed them the stone rolled away first, then the grave clothes and the body gone. Then he sent them an angel. Then they shared testimony. Then the Lord Jesus appeared to Mary by herself, then to Peter by herself by himself, then to two walking down the road to Emmaus, then to eleven, and then to five hundred at once. Do you see how gently it grew? The evidence, the testimony, the direct relationship with one, then two, then eleven, then five hundred, and that's how it's happened today. Quietly, unnoticed, Jesus is making someone take the Bible and read the record and study the evidence. And then he's introducing them to other Christians who testify of their relationship and what God has said to them. And bit by bit he prepares them and draws them until the great day comes when they meet Jesus. I think of a young man now, not long ago, got hold of a Bible and started reading it. Came and talked with me so I gave him my testimony and, and told him what I knew and had experienced. Then he went off. Two or three days later, he said, I was just walking down the high street and I met Jesus. Just walking down the high street. Glory to God in the high street. <laughs> and that's when it really means something. I could spend a lot of time going through the evidence. It's very convincing. But that wouldn't be enough to make you a Christian. You might agree intellectually it's a sound case, but it wouldn't make you a Christian. I could give you my testimony and hundreds of others here could give you their testimony, and that wouldn't convince you either. Wouldn't make you a Christian, though you would say, well, I envy them their experience and it, it seems real to them, but one day when you are ready to do so, you will meet Jesus. And then you'll have no doubt about the resurrection. You'll just say what a friend of mine said. He was a converted bookmaker in County Durham. Somebody said, how do you know that Jesus is alive? And he said, well, I was talking to him only this morning. Let us talk to him. Father, we thank you for the evidence and the record of that evidence in your word. We thank you for the testimony of those who've known but we thank you most for those moments when we have been alone with Jesus and have known him to be alive. This is such a moment. Lord Jesus, I almost feel like I could just reach out my hand and touch you. You're here. Praise be to you. Please make yourself real to everyone here. Make yourself known to them, that they may know and love you and serve you. For your name's sake. Amen.